Hi, folks. Um, cool. Thanks for having me at ODSC. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about chaos and pain in machine learning um, and uh, what we're calling the MLOps manifesto. Um, what I mean by MLOps is, is DevOps for ML, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that um, uh, in a moment. I wanted to start by saying, sort of full disclosure, um, I, uh, I'm the founder of a, a company that is, um, that is building tools for data scientists. But what I didn't want to do in this talk was to make it an explicit product pitch. So I'm not going to kind of shove dot science down your throat here. Instead, what I'm going to try and do is to outline kind of the problem um, that I believe needs solving in the industry and to also um, uh, go through an architecture and a set of open source tools that you can use uh, to solve the problem yourself. Um, there are lots of amazing open source tools. Um, I do believe that in order to solve this problem, you have to kind of put them together yourself. You have to build your own car uh, before you can drive it. Um, and so if you can't be bothered to do that, then of course we've got a, a, a solution. But it is also interesting to look at how you can combine the tools yourself and, and, and how, you can, uh, how you can solve these problems um, uh, by um, combining open source tools. <coughs> and so I wanted to, to start by defining what I mean by MLOps. Um, I see MLOps really at the um, intersection of these three disciplines of DevOps, uh, software engineering, um, and machine learning. Um, and if we just want to take a, a step back in time for a second and think about how we got to where we are today in terms of software engineering, obviously decades and decades ago, people were doing software engineering with punch cards, and then there were big multi-user Unix mainframes, personal computers, and network computers. And not that long ago, sort of the 80s and the 90s, uh, people did software development by emailing patch files around. I mean, that's how the Linux kernel was developed initially. Um, and so people had to maintain a local copy of, their, um, of a source code repository, and they had to manually integrate changes from different people. And it was, it was complicated. It, it was messy. Um, and, um, and it was painful. And it meant that software took months to ship rather than minutes. Um, and then tools like Subversion came along and made it possible for us to have centralized version control. And more recently, tools like Git and GitHub have come along, which have made it possible to do distributed version control. Um, and what I mean by that is that if I'm a software engineer, I'm not talking about machine learning right now, if I'm just a regular software engineer working on a software project, I can uh, take a, um, I can find a project that someone else is working on, on GitHub, uh, either as part of my organization or an open source project, and I can make a fork of it. And I can change the code um, on my fork without having to tread on their toes. Um, and then I can easily propose those changes uh, to my collaborator uh, in a pull request. And this means that you can do distributed asynchronous collaboration on software. Um, so let's talk about DevOps. Uh, that's another one of the um, sort of pieces in the puzzle here. Um, so the history of DevOps, roughly, is that we used to edit code live on the server, or at least I did. I'm guilty of that. Um, uh, and then we, uh, we built binaries, and there was a period of time where it was very common for, um, uh, for software engineers to email binaries to the ops people, and then the ops people would put it on the server and they'd run it. Um, and that, was, that kind of sucked for many different reasons. Like the, there was silos between the ops team and the development team. Um, and, and then there was this sort of uh, revolution in the way that software engineering happened to, to try and combine those teams and say that software engineers should actually be responsible for running uh, and operating the software that they developed as well. And, and this made it possible to iterate much more quickly on software because there wasn't a human handover um, from software to, um, uh, to operations. And another thing that happened was that continuous, continuous integration systems became very popular. Um, 
So tools like GitLab and Jenkins made it possible to automatically run tests every time a piece of software was shipped. And um, the public cloud has also taken off in a big way, which means that we no longer have to operate our own data centers. Instead, we can elastically scale compute uh, and easily deploy software continuously, continuously deliver software from our CI systems uh, into, into the public cloud. The thing that's happened more recently than that even, so coming up to the last uh, five, five years really, is the huge rise in um, this thing called immutable infrastructure. And immutable infrastructure is the notion that um, the applications that you run should really be stateless and they can be packaged in Docker containers and um, those Docker containers they're not going to change. So once you ship a piece of software, it's frozen with all of the dependencies and it can be uh, uh, packaged in a way that the same Docker container will, the, a given Docker image will run the same today as it will in nine months, even if you've upgraded the operating system on the, on the servers that you're running it on. The other thing that uh, has taken off in a big way is Kubernetes, which is a project that originally came out of Google, um, which has made it possible to, the way I think about this is the infrastructure that you run your application on can be like a, um, like, like the human body in the sense that the cells in your body are constantly being renewed. And so the actual matter that you're made of today is different to the matter that you were made of 10, 10 years ago or five years ago. And in the same way with, with immutable infrastructure and Kubernetes, you can swap in new machines and you can take old ones out. And because the, the, the cluster is just scheduling these immutable containers across um, the machines, it doesn't matter if like, you add some machines and then you take them away and you add some more and you take the old ones away. Um, the whole thing can carry on running. And, um, and, and this really helps with, with reliability and resilience um, uh, of software. So we've come a long way from editing code live on one server uh, to this world of immutable infrastructure. And I'll just give a nod to the notion of GitOps as well, um, which uh, a friend and colleague, a former colleague of mine, Alexis Richardson at Weaveworks, invented the term, was this notion that you should, just in the way that we've started version controlling uh, software really well, um, we should also version control a source of truth for the software that's running in production. And so the actual configuration of what's running on a Kubernetes cluster um, should itself be version controlled. And that means that now we're bringing the notion of version control and pull requests and the whole sort of handoff process that you can achieve with that to, um, uh, to the world of immutable infrastructure as well. OK, so far, so good. So far, I've only talked about software and DevOps, um, which are fairly well established disciplines. Now, I don't need to tell a room full of data scientists about machine learning. Um, so I will just summarize by saying that we've come a long way um, from sort of the first AI winter in the 60s uh, to deep learning and machine learning um, really becoming computationally feasible. Um, and, and I guess I would just summarize machine learning as, kind of, as how we use data and maths together to train models um, that we can use to predict behavior about the world. The interesting challenge is that um, machine learning is really, at, even in 2019, it, it's emerging from a research environment into an environment where uh, companies are increasingly trying to operationalize it. And so what they're doing is they're trying, and, and this is, uh, we, everyone has, I'm sure is aware of this kind of explosion in excitement and hype around machine learning and AI. Um, as uh, big companies in all industries across the world are realizing that they can um, uh, get significant value out of it, if only they can figure out how to actually build models and operate them. <coughs> and so my point here is that there's this convergence of software engineering, DevOps, and machine learning um, that will be called MLOps. MLOps is uh, the emerging industry term that people use to refer to this. Um, now, I also believe that AI has the potential to change the world in a genuinely positive way. Um, 
at the same time, as a discipline, it's, it's immature because as I say, it's coming out of this world of, of research and people are trying to figure out how to operationalize it. And what, uh, what me and my team have found in talking to hundreds of teams trying to do this in the last year and a half is that um, they're actually quite damaging levels of chaos and pain trying to, go, uh, trying to operationalize AI. It's very easy to build a toy model um, on a data set that you have on your laptop, but it's quite difficult to um, uh, set up the necessary process for, for actually running that model in production in a way that it can be updated in a reliable way, in a way that it can solve um, all of the problems that have already been solved by DevOps uh, for software. So some of the problems that we've seen um, are that data science teams um, uh, often waste a lot of time, for example, um, getting an environment set up in exactly the way that a colleague had it set up with the same libraries, the same data set, um, the same parameters and so on when they're, when they're training models. We've seen uh, collaboration that often um, feels a lot like the kind of collaboration that happened in software development um, in the 90s, where people are emailing Jupyter notebooks to each other. Um, and I guess the modern equivalent is that they're slacking Jupyter notebooks to each other. Um, but there's uh, Jupyter notebooks, for example, don't work very well with, with the, the version control tools um, like Git. And, um, and, the, and the tooling for software, de for software engineering um, doesn't work super well with, uh, with, with the approaches that you have to uh, take when you're, when you're doing machine learning. We've also seen a lot of manual tracking. Um, and so a symptom of that is that uh, organizations will often have uh, a spreadsheet to keep track of uh, their models and where their models came from. Um, so uh, you might have a spreadsheet of models that has cells for um, we use this data set and this version of the code and these parameters and we got this accuracy score or this F score. Um, and I mean, can you imagine uh, a CI pipeline being implemented in terms of spreadsheets when you're, when you're deploying <laughs> software? Um, it definitely feels like that's a, a kind of anti-pattern. Another problem is that there's a lack of reproducibility and provenance. So that means not being able to um, uh, reproduce a model that, that my colleague, who might have left the company, uh, created nine months ago because things have moved on, the data's changed, we've got new versions of Python libraries and so on. Um, another problem is that we see a lot of models that go into production and then aren't properly monitored because it's actually harder to monitor models uh, than it is to monitor microservices and, and regular software. And another one that's, that isn't on this list um, is that we've also found a surprising number of companies are just really struggling to deploy models at all. So getting models into production um, is, is difficult. And, um, and uh, that's actually a major blocker um, in, uh, in some big companies that we've spoken to. Um, so that's kind of the problem space that we're in. Um, and here are some interesting quotes that we got from real people. I won't attribute them to specific people or companies, but um, we spoke to, uh, to one team that said, in retrospect, if we'd been able to save the versions or gone back in time to see how a certain data scientist uh, figured out the learning rate that they used, then it would have avoided a lot of questions from the auditors. And it's interesting that machine learning teams are now being audited, um, and they're, they're needing to be able to justify the reasons why they chose uh, certain um, parameters and chose certain data sets. Um, and another person that we spoke to said that two of the data scientists who worked on a particular model have left and they've gone to other companies. Um, and you want to be able to see what they did and how they did it and you don't want them to walk out of the door with the knowledge in their head, basically. Um, another company said that the, the model that um, that they had running in production failed for three months and they lost an immeasurable amount of money. They didn't even know how much money they lost because the model was making like crazy decisions in production and, and people didn't notice. Like um, maybe they uh, gotten the quality the wrong, wrong way around and they deployed a model and they just didn't notice that it was making completely bonkers decisions. 
Um, uh, Another conversation we had said that we could have solved these problems by keeping paper logs like we do in kind of the world of science. But they also said that if we asked the data scientists to write down every single thing that they did, then they would probably want to leave. Um, and another, one, another person said we keep our data science team small and we keep them in the same room so they can track their summary statistics by talking to each other and remembering them. <laughs> um, it's scary. Um, but it's also the case that we've been here before. So, so back in the 90s, software engineering was siloed and there was no version control. There was certainly no continuous delivery. And like I said, software took months to ship back in the 90s and now it ships in minutes. Um, the same is possible for AI, um, but you need to build new tooling to really enable this to happen. Um, so there are four, um, I, so I mentioned the the MLOps manifesto or DevOps for ML manifesto, um, we've identified these four key requirements that if you can't achieve these requirements, then you're going to have a bad time. Um, and I'm interested in people's feedback. And please tell me if you think that we missed one or, um, or what your thoughts are on this um, af after the talk. Uh, but the first one is that every model has to be, and, and by the way, these. Um, uh, these requirements are generally solved already for software engineering and DevOps. Um, the first one is reproducibility. So it, a test for this is can I um, retra retrain a model that my colleague who's now left the company trained nine months ago and get the same statistics to within at least a few percent. Um, I'm not saying it has to be exactly the same accuracy score because um, some models um, uh, train slightly differently each time you train them, uh, especially deep learning models. There's, there's often a little bit of randomness involved. Um, but you should at least be able to get almost the same result uh, nine months later. And that means you need to be able to pin down um, the versions of the libraries you were using, the exact data set, the hyperparameters, and the code. Um, another requirement um, is that models have to be accountable. And I, I use the word accountable in the same sense that we hold humans accountable for our decision making, for, for their decision making processes. So for example, if you have a judge making decisions in a court, um, you at least need to know who the judge is, you need a sense of identity, and you need uh, to know on what basis they're making their decisions. And so um, if you don't, uh, and, and the equivalent for that in machine learning is that you need to know um, on what basis uh, the model is making their decisions, um, or its decisions, and that means knowing which data it was trained on. And so if you don't have that basic level of, we know that this model that was running in production was trained on this version of the data set, and we can recreate, or we can get access to that exact version of the data set, then you don't have accountability, um, and uh, that means you don't have provenance. You don't have the ability to trace back from a model that's running in production um, to exactly where it came from. The third requirement is that uh, the model development process has to be collaborative. And so I talked in the introduction about um, how software development is very collaborative with tools like GitHub. Uh, and, and so what I would say is the requirement for machine learning development to be collaborative is that it must be possible for me to take um, a project that you're working on uh, make a fork of it, and then you must be able to carry on working on that project independently of me, and I must be able to make changes to that project without treading on your toes. Um, and then I have to be able to integrate changes that you've made back into my version, and I have to be able to propose, once I've made that, once I've done that integration and my version is up to date with respect to your version, I have to be able to propose those changes back to you. And maybe that's like a master branch or an upstream um, in the sense of Git and Git flow. Um, and if we can't do asynchronous collaboration, then it means that we have to revert to synchronous collaboration. That means being in the same room or being on a video call together, editing the same um, files or sharing a keyboard, you know. Um, and, and that's, if you fail the collaborative, uh, the collaboration test, then it makes it much harder to, um, you know, it makes it, uh, it, 
it basically reduces the effectiveness of your machine learning team, especially as your machine learning team scales. Um, so the more people you have, the more um, uh, chaos there'll be in terms of people trying to collaborate with each other. The final point is that um, MLOps or DevOps for ML has to be continuous. What that means is that I have to be able to deploy a model into production without any manual steps. Because as soon as there are manual steps in deploying a model, um, then uh, human error will get in the way of making sure that you have a complete record of which model was running in production and when. Um, and so um, that means you have to be able to deploy automatically. And you also need to be able to monitor a model once it's running. And so this is where um, models are weird from a software and DevOps perspective. They're strange because when you've got a normal software microservice, you might, you, you'll monitor the requ request rate, the latency of each request, and the error rate. Um, but a model could be making decisions in production, and it could have completely normal error rates, completely normal latency, but it could be making completely bonkers decisions. And there's no way of knowing just by looking at the normal sort of software metrics for monitoring um, what's happening there. But what you can do, and I'm sure many people in, in the room know this and you may already be doing this, um, it's possible to look at the statistical distribution of the classifications a model is making in production, for example. So if it's, um, if it's a road signs model um, uh, that might be part of an autonomous vehicle, um, that's using sensor data to figure out what road signs there are on the street, um, then you might have uh, sort of reasonable expectations of a certain number of classifications of stop signs um, per hour uh, if you have a fleet of autonomous vehicles. And if the number of stop signs that you're detecting drops to zero, um, then you really want to know about that because either you deployed a bad model and it can't predict and it can't classify stop signs anymore, or something changed about the world. Um, and in the case that something changed about the world, maybe it's the case that your road sign model can't, can't uh, classify stop signs in the snow. Like stranger things have happened in the, world to, in the world of machine learning. Um, so you need this ability to, to continuously statistically monitor um, the uh, decisions that your model is making in production. And so if we kind of take as an assumption that um, these requirements are important. Um, we can also see that um, data engineering and machine learning is, is significantly and meaningfully different from software development. Um, it's just fundamentally a harder thing to do. And this is why um, the entire industry is, is, is chewing on this problem of um, bringing machine learning into a software life cycle, a, a DevOps life cycle. And the reason for that is that software development is actually quite straightforward. You write some code, you push it into a CI system and it gets tested. If all the tests pass, then you can deploy it. And then once it's deployed, you can monitor it by looking at error rates and latency and such. And you might use information that you get from your monitoring system, like, oh, this new version is too slow in production, so we're going to need to optimize a certain bit of the code. And so we go back around and we, and we change the code, and then we push it through the CI system again, we deploy it, and then we monitor it. And so normal software engineering and DevOps is about going around this loop as quickly as you can. Um, but machine learning uh, is just more complicated. There's data um, that's constantly changing, and the world is constantly changing, and you're trying to detect patterns in, in this changing data. Um, you have code that's used to uh, train a model. Um, you also have uh, parameters, the hyperparameters that are adjusted when you're training a model. Um, and then you have the model itself. And so um, we then, uh, from the model, we have um, models that need to be versioned. And we have metrics that are associated with each model. And it's that model artifact that is the thing that you then deploy into production. And then you have to monitor it. And the way that you monitor it is more complicated as well, as I've described. And so we end up with this sort of shape that is just, you can tell that it's more complicated. And, and um, so what we found is that, um, and we're not the only ones in the industry doing this, 
But what we found is that if you switch from thinking about just versioning code to instead versioning runs, then this all gets a lot more tractable. It gets a lot easier to cope with. Um, and what that means is that uh, you should be thinking about um, the runs of a data engineering pipeline. Uh, you should be versioning the version of the code that runs, uh, the version of the input files that it's reading, and the version of the output files that are created um, in, for example, a, a data engineering pipeline step. Um, and when you're um, training a model, you should be versioning what we call model runs. Um, and that means that you should version a certain uh, version of the input data, maybe the training test and validation set for a model that you're training, um, plus the code that was used to train the model. Uh, I didn't even include on this diagram the environment that the model is trained in, but you need to version that as well, the parameters, um, and then you get a certain version of a model that you should be able to tie back to all of those inputs. Um, and, um, and yeah, if, if you can do this, if you can switch um, this kind of fundamental switch to not, you're not thinking about versioning lines of code anymore. Uh, you need to do that. That's a prerequisite. But you're also versioning the execution of code against certain input data that creates certain output data. Then you can start to build up a graph of what's going on, um, and you can and you can start to keep track of your work in a way that is amenable to the collaboration patterns and deployment patterns that are common in DevOps. Um, so I'm quickly going to run through the model lifecycle um, so, uh, and talk about how this run tracking can apply to the model lifecycle. So in the data engineering stage of the model lifecycle, um, you're labeling your data, you're doing feature engineering, um, and you're transforming raw data into uh, training data, basically. Um, and in this context, you need to be tr keeping track, like I say, of these, of these runs, the data runs. So this version of this input uh, data um, was run against this version of the code in this environment, and it created this version of this output data. Um, that way, you have this provenance record of um, where things came from. And if uh, stakeholders later contend decisions that are made by a model, um, or you need to debug why a model is misbehaving, maybe nine months down, down the line, you've got this record of exactly what went into uh, creating the data and where it came from. This is also essential if you want to be able to, um, uh, for example, uh, isolate bias in your training data. It's, you can't do that if you don't know exactly what training data it was. Um, then in the model development process, uh, data is coming in from data engineering. You're training a model on a certain version of a data set. Um, and, um, then you have metrics that come out of that model training process that you need to keep track of, and you have models themselves um, which need to be deployed. Um, those models then need to be deployed into a production environment, and then once they're running in production, um, they need to be statistically monitored, and you need to be able to keep track of um, the real-time decisions that those models are making that may also have an impact on the world and therefore need to be reflected <coughs> Uh, in a changing database that will be used for retraining a later model. Um, and you need to be able to go around this loop, and you need to be able to do it quickly, safely, while keeping track of everything, keeping track of all the moving parts. OK, and so in this last section, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to describe how you can build something that does this. Um, and uh, there are some key open source components that we've used um, in our platform uh, that I can recommend. Um, Docker, ZFS or ZFS, uh, Kubernetes, and Prometheus are just some of the pieces um, that we're doing. Um, and so there's this kind of life cycle that we're, that we're trying to get through here, from development into continuous integration into continuous delivery, and then observability and monitoring um, while the models are running in production. Uh, and the key point here is that version control is fundamental and enabling to keeping track of everything. Um, and so if you want to do reproducible machine learning, then you need to keep track of the following things. You need to keep track of the environment, you need to keep track of the code and the notebooks, and you need to keep track of the data, of course. Um, and the way that you can do this, uh, let's go through each of those in turn. So when you're pinning down the environment uh, in which you're training a model or serving a model, then I highly recommend that you use Docker. Um, it is uh, 
kind of a fairly low level tool, but it's actually quite usable. The user, the, the CLI is very good. Um, and it allows you to create and then run um, sort of frozen copies of uh, the Linux operating system with your code in it. Um, so that means that if you run it twice, in theory, modulo uh, randomness, it will behave in the same way, even if the server that you're running it on um, is 12 months older um, or newer. Um, uh, of course, for versioning uh, code, you should use Git. It's pretty much become the de facto way of, of versioning code. Um, and uh, however, there are some challenges with Git. Um, for one thing, in, when you're iterating on a model, it's not really natural to commit every time you change every, anything. Um, so while you're tuning parameters and then rerunning a model, um, it doesn't necessarily come naturally to people to make a new git commit every time they change something. And that makes it hard to keep track of what you were doing. And again, you, humans will reach for a notepad or a spreadsheet or something to, to try and keep track manually. Um, and the other problem is that Git doesn't cope with large files, and data scientists often mingle code and data, of course, because those are the things they're working on. Um, and the other, the other problem with Git is that it sucks for using Jupyter Notebooks, because Jupyter Notebooks are JSON files. And if you've ever tried to merge a diff of JSON files, I see some people nodding, um, then uh, that can be pretty painful. You might not even end up with valid JSON. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just not very fun to read them. Um, so what we propose as a new architecture for this is using a lightweight file system snapshotting technology called ZFS. And we built an open source project on top of ZFS, uh, which is called .mesh. Um, and we, I kind of think of it like Git for data. Um, the nice thing about this is that uh, the ZFS file system allows you to take very, um, very cheap, lightweight snapshots you can snapshot a terabyte of data in less than a second because it uses copy on write technology that I can't fully explain in six minutes. Um, but um, on top of uh, the ability to take lightweight file system snapshots very efficiently um, and also move them around easily, which is important, um, uh, you can also attach um, metadata to each of your ZFS snapshots. Um, and um, that means that you can attach metadata like, OK, so for this run, um, uh, we used these metrics and these hyperparameters, and we got uh, these results. And you can also build a, a graph out of the relationship between um, these snapshots by uh, tracking um, the version of the input data that was read when um, a certain model was trained, for example. It's also possible to use, uh, uh, there's a project from Jupyter called NBDime uh, for notebook diff and merge um, to, as the name suggests, diff and merge notebooks. Um, and you can build a system on top of NBDime that, that allows um, uh, kind of pull request style workflows. Um, so that's the development side. Uh, the, the next piece of the pipeline is going from development into continuous integration. Um, and in this case, I strongly recommend using some kind of CI system, um, so like Circle CI or, or Jenkins or, or GitLab. Um, and, and it's important to version your work while you're doing interactive development in Jupyter. Um, and maybe you're using Jupyter to prototype models. Uh, but I've spoken to a lot of people who, when they go into a more production-like pipeline for model development, um, they, uh, they use um, uh, they just use Python scripts rather than Jupyter notebooks. And those Python scripts can be run from inside a CI pipeline. Um, if you can configure your CI pipeline to run against version data um, and create a version model, and then also publish those metrics somewhere that you can compare them, um, then you can build a system that allows you to uh, say, this model, how does it compare to that model, and make sure you're doing an apples to apples comparison. Um, and you ought to also be able to promote a model into production directly from having trained it in your CI system. Um, and there should be no, uh, no manual steps um, in that. And so once you've um, built a model, um, 
in your CI system, and by the way, your CI system should be generating Docker images. Um, your CI system can push Docker images into a Docker registry, and then those um, uh, models can be pulled in from the Docker registry and run in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, Kubernetes gives you all of the production-ready concerns, or it solves all the production-ready concerns, like being able to scale your model horizontally, um, like being able to tolerate machines failing, machines coming and going. Um, and so what you'll need to do is to um, have your CI system uh, push um, Kubernetes uh, YAML files, which uh, describe the, which refer to the container images, um, and to have those automatically pushed into a staging environment or, or a production environment. Um, and then once your model is running in production, um, and I could talk for hours about Kubernetes, uh, but I but I won't. Um, but once your model is running in in production in Kubernetes. Um, then monitoring uh, that model can be done with a tool called Prometheus, and Prometheus has a sort of sister project which is called Grafana uh, for doing dashboards. Um, and um, so you can um, create these dashboards uh, using a language called PromQL, which is a, a query language for the Prometheus database. Um, and what you can do is you can instrument your model um, with Prometheus metrics, which allows it to, for example, look at the distribution um, of predictions that that model is making, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And then you can use Grafana to, uh, to query that. Um, and like I said, monitoring models is different to monitoring microservices. You really want to be looking at things like the distribution of the classifications that that model is making um, in production. Um, so I've got, I've got two minutes left. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to show a very fast demo of um, something that, that we put together that sort of pulls all these pieces together. Um, and if you want to see more of this, I'm going to attempt a 25-minute live demo that goes into um, lots more detail uh, about this in uh, another talk this afternoon in Alsace uh, at 2.30. So um, come and uh, pray to the demo gods with me <laughs> if you like at 2.30. Um, but the, the very short version is that we can have a, a Jupyter environment here which is running on top of a ZFS file system. Um, and so when we are, um, uh, when a data scientist is updating, for example, the uh, parameters um, that go into that model, um, you can build a, a, a Python library, like our dot science Python library, which records the parameters and, and summary statistics and keeps track of them. Um, and then when you're running um, your model training, um, you, can, uh, you can capture these runs, which say, for example, I used three uh, epochs here, and I used the Adam optimizer, and I got an accuracy score of 90, 98.5%. And this can all be attached to, um, to ZFS snapshot metadata. Um, so from there, we, you can then keep track of uh, which runs and the, the data sets, uh, the exact files that went into each run, and um, then uh, you can keep track of the relationship between the hyperparameters and the summary statistics, like I used this optimizer and I got this summary score. And then you can build a plot that shows um, the uh, uh, kind of how the accuracy of a, the model evolved over time. Um, then um, you can um, also build, I was talking about provenance earlier, by chaining these uh, snapshots together and, and looking at how um, the output of one thing was used as the input for another thing. You can create a provenance graph a bit, bit like this, which says this exact model came from running this exact version um, of the code against this exact training test and validation set. And that exact version of the data came from running this data engineering script, which read it in from this other file. And so you can, uh, you can keep track of provenance like that. Um, and then uh, just, I think, 20 more seconds in this video. Um, you can then uh, hook up a model to, um, uh, to build a Docker image and deploy that Docker image to production. And so you can build a UI around that. And then you can use uh, Grafana and Prometheus to keep track of the distribution of the uh, predictions that your model is making. Um, in production. Um, 
So with that said, um, that's the end of my talk. Um, please do come and check out the longer demo if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. You can try out what we're doing um, on our website. Um, and if you're interested in this stuff, please drop me an email, just a one-liner, um, or uh, come and talk to us. We're just by the, um, the entrance uh, to the main area upstairs. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>